The wildfire in August that ripped through the Hawaiian town of Lahaina was America's deadliest in 100 years. At least 99 people were killed. You may recall the pictures of people jumping into the Pacific Ocean to escape as the fire burned most of the historic town in a matter of hours. But there is an untold story about a group of firefighters who were also trapped while fighting fast-moving flames. Tonight, you will hear from those Maui County firefighters about two of the worst hours of their lives. They took a stand to save their hometown without the thing they depend on the most, water. The morning began with blue skies and winds gusting nearly 60 miles an hour. The story will continue in a moment. I was just watching the ocean and watching what was happening on the ocean and just never seeing that before. What was happening on the ocean? It just was like froth. It was completely white. And there was like whirlwind that was sat out there for over an hour. Like that had been whipped Yeah, out. yeah, the winds were just nuts. Firefighter Ina Kohler drives engine three. She grew up in Lahaina, the once postcard perfect town of 13,000 tucked between the West Maui Range and sparkling Pacific. In Hawaiian, Lahaina means cruel sun. But on August 8th, it was the wind. Whipped up by a hurricane 500 miles offshore that showed no mercy. We're used to wind, but we weren't used to that kind of wind. I looked out my window and there was like a giant kiddie pool, like one of the bigger ones, flying through the air, like 100 feet up. Freaking power line just went down. At 6.30 that morning, a resident recorded this video after a power line fell and ignited the dry grass that covers much of Lahaina's hillside. At most, there are 17 firefighters on duty in West Maui. Kohler's crew of four relieved the firefighters that first responded. We had, we had contained it, mean, meaning it wasn't getting any bigger. So now we were just putting water on all the hot spots to make sure that it was everything was fully out, just dousing everything in water. How long were you out there? We were probably till like two. And then we went on some calls in the neighborhood right next door of down poles and that were leaning on houses and down lines. Around three o'clock, Ina Kohler's crew was called back to the area of the morning brush fire. This is police video. Hey, there's a full painting. The hillside was on fire again. How fast was the fire moving at that point? Um, I couldn't tell. I could tell how fast the smoke was moving and it was kind of like not even going up. It was just going sideways. There's a big flame in here. The cause of the afternoon fire is still unknown, but Mike Walker had warned Hawaiian lawmakers about the danger of overgrown grass here for five years. So how much of this is native to Hawaii? Uh, none of it. Walker is in charge of fire protection for Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources. The type of grass he showed us is from Africa. It was brought here a century ago for cattle grazing because it grows fast, even with little water. What can you do to make sure that this isn't a tinderbox? Well, a lot of the land right now is just unmanaged. It's either folks don't have the finances or it's not economically worth it to work the land or they're just banking the land for future development. I think you can see what happens when we do nothing. On August 8th, a few minutes after 3 o'clock, wind carried burning grass toward homes half a mile away. And by the time I reported that over the radio, um, every structure I could see was on fire. Six foot four Kiahi Ho is based in Lahaina on Ladder 3. He mans its biggest weapon, a cannon that shoots 2,000 gallons of water a minute. It would just blow away, you know. Um, I could stick it right in a window and put out that room, but the whole rest of the house is on fire, and then every other house is on fire. Then, something he'd never experienced left him stunned. The hydrants started to run dry. It was a real low point for me, because um, we just, I knew that we had lost, you know, that we were gonna really, this was gonna be worse than we could imagine. The county's Department of Water Supply told us the fire caused more than 2,000 pipe breaks, bleeding water out of the system. It was somewhere around there that I heard that the, um, for my mom's offices, which is a long ways away from where I was, it was on fire. And then 
to know that it was there and to know that I was running out of water, I was like, man, it's over. Like, we're gonna keep trying, but there's, it's over. This was the view from inside a fire truck. Black skies lit by an inferno that stretched for blocks. Firefighters didn't have the water or the crews to stop it. Residents say they never received an evacuation order. So by 4 p.m., police were racing around town to get people out. Let's go! Hurry up! same time, reinforcements started to arrive from other fire stations across Maui, including 26-year-old Tanner Mosier. He was with Engine 6. Once you got into the smoke, it was like five feet of visibility, maybe 10 if you're lucky. It's like a blowtorch being blown at you. The heat was just so intense. Captain Jay Fujita has been a firefighter almost as long as Tanner Mosier has been alive. He commanded Engine 1 to take a position a few blocks beyond that wall of fire next to Mosier's crew. At 4.30, streets were clogged with the cars of residents and tourists. This was a 911 operator. You guys need to leave. If you can't, if you can't drive away, get out of the car and run. The abandoned cars and a web of downed power lines trapped the eight firefighters and their two engines. Once we determined we were able to escape the um, street that we were on, uh, we pulled a line to kind of protect ourselves from the fire. Just from the to keep structure. the fire away from you. Yeah, but the hose burnt. So you don't have a hose yeah. and you can't get out. Yeah. Our only course of action was to shelter in place. Inside the engines, they relied on air tanks to breathe. And we were just conserving our air as much as possible and just sitting in our seats. We were just fixating on making it out, lasting. So at that point, it's surviving. It's surviving, for sure. I mean, we could see metal melting in front of our eyes. I had texted my wife. Uh, I told her I love her and to pass a message on to the rest of my family that I love them, that we're stuck and we might not be able to make it out. But it was too hot in the truck, so my phone wasn't working, so the message didn't go through. I just remember being like, I can't give up yet. Like, I got I to gotta do something. And so I remember looking out the window, and all of a sudden I could see um, Engine 1 Skeeter, Mini 1. The Skeeter is a small fire truck like this one. Mosier jumped into it alone to see if he could clear a path for the engines to get out. Mosier says when he realized the Skeeter couldn't drive through the barricade of cars, he made the snap decision to drive over them to find help. And so I just remember putting a four-wheel drive and I launched the barricade and I kind of planed for a second and I was like, oh, okay, I made it over. And at the end of the lot was a rock wall. So I launched over the rock wall and definitely caught some power lines. So I'll just be driving through the smoke, not seeing anything. So I'm just like driving through, dodging stuff. His truck was damaged, but down the road, he saw the lights of a police car. I just remember leaving most of my stuff in that truck, getting out, running to the cop and just telling him like, hey, I got guys in there. They need help, they're dying. And so he's just like, hey, you can, you can take my squad vehicle, just come back. And so I, I hopped in there and just started driving back into the smoke where I knew I came from or where I remembered coming from. As Mosier made his way back, Captain Fujita realized the fire truck was no longer offering protection. Um, I noticed um, our windshield failing, it started to fail. Your windshield failing, what do you mean? So the... Uh, Windshield is made up of uh, two panes of glass with a film in the middle, and that film was, you know, delaminating and bubbling in the windshield. So it's melting around you. Yeah. So we got out of the truck, and we all sheltered behind the engine. We heard uh, like a chirping of a siren, but because of the smoke, we really couldn't see where it was coming from. But finally, we seen a, a police SUV show up. It was Tanner Mosier. Seven firefighters in gear crammed inside the SUV Mosier was driving, including his captain, Mike Mulally, who was unconscious from smoke inhalation. He's on the far left in this picture, taken before the fire. He was in the car. 
the SUV with the door open and his boots were, were hanging, but they weren't touching the ground. So they're just holding on to Captain? Yeah, so all the guys that were able to reach him, they're just locked on. With his captain's legs dangling out, Mosier says he jumped the loaded police SUV to safety. Did Tanner Mosier save your life that day? Yes, he saved all of our lives. He's a young guy. You can't teach that kind of uh, heroism. Uh, he just had it in him. Once clear, the firefighters performed CPR and stabilized Captain Mulali. And then all seven of us went back to work. You kept fighting fires? Yep. All the way till the next morning. With little water, there was little they could do to save homes. So as the sun set, the firefighters' mission shifted to saving anyone they could, any way they could. Ina Kohler ditched her fire engine and used a pickup to snake through the burning debris downtown. A local, she knew every way in and out. There were some people in their cars stuck down there not knowing which way to get out. And so I would jump in their car and I would drive their car out for them. So everybody's trying to get out and you're going in? Yeah. Kohler, a mother of two, said her family was able to escape. But like 16 other firefighters in Lahaina, she lost her home. Did you ever think, like, why me? No, I was like, every, everything else is burned down, why not my house? You know, I didn't want to be feeling like I couldn't defend, you know, the entire town. And if my house was still standing, I'd probably have even more guilt. Once the sparkling jewel of Maui, this is Lahaina today. Its treasures now a sea of ash and charred metal. More than 2,000 homes and businesses were destroyed. Hawaii's attorney general is investigating the cause of the afternoon fire and how the water system failed. Already in the hills above Lahaina, the flammable grass that set the stage for this disaster is growing back. Captain Jay Fujita took us to the street where his crew made its stand. Your engine was right there? Yeah, right there. Those ashes in front of us are the outline of where fire consumed what was once engine one. It's kind of like, like a grave, you know, coming back to see this. After we left, it still was hot enough and bad enough to burn the engine. To nothing? Yeah. What do you think about the fight now when you look back on it? I think we all feel wish we could have done more. We made it out and we're grateful, but at the same time, there, there's still people that didn't make it out. Not far from where the Lahaina fire began is a line of crosses, one for each person who died. The 100th victim was identified last week. But by our count, Maui firefighters rescued at least 200 people from the flames. <laughs> 